My brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, Bismillah ta'ala, we are on the seventh of the eight lessons from the life of Hatim Rasam, Rahmatullah We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to learn from these beautiful people who are, uh, who are our brothers and sisters in Islam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us worthy of being called their brothers and sisters. And that will happen only if we behave like them. These people were not known only for the amount of knowledge they had. Alhamdulillah, they had a huge amount of knowledge. But they were known much more and more and very rightly for what they did with that knowledge, how they used that knowledge, how they made uh, that knowledge a means of khair and barakah for themselves and for others. This is the, uh, the main reason for the fame of uh, people like Hatim al-Qasam and others, our Salaf al-Salihin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to be like them, uh, to emulate them and to therefore uh, be with them when we are uh, resurrected before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us this dua. Hidna salat al-Mustaqeem, salat al-Ladheena an'amta alayhim. Inshallah, these are the people who are among the Anam Ta'alihim, the Sahaba of Rasulullah the Salaf Salihin, the Awliya of Allah, and above all, the Anbiya Alayhim Salam themselves. Uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala showed them to us as examples for us to lead our lives. I think that is a very, very important uh, lesson that uh, we must learn. I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to enable us to learn this lesson, Inshallah. Um, it's a very beautiful morning where I'm, uh, where I'm living, and I decided therefore to sit outside and do this uh, Fajr Dimayr. It's a bit cold, but otherwise, Alhamdulillah, it's uh, very, very nice, very pleasant, bright sunlight. Uh, this is the beauty of this part of the world of America, where um, even in the winter you don't have the dull, gloomy skies that you have in a lot of other places. Here, it's uh, always bright and sunny. The seventh lesson. Of ha- that Hatim al Asam learned from his Sheikh Al Shafiq al Balqi, and which he repeated to him. He said that I looked around myself and I found that people rely on creatures, they rely on created things instead of relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to clarify one thing which is the usual doubt that people ask in this context. Uh, they say that, you know, we live in this world, so we have uh, businesses, we have people we work with and so on and so forth. Uh, children rely on their parents, uh, parents, we rely on governments, we rely on the state. So, I mean, w- relying on somebody or uh, expecting something beneficial to come from somebody, is this haram? The answer is it is not haram. The question of reliance is in the heart. Where is it in the heart? Islam does not prevent us from taking help of the means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the Khaliq of the Asbab. He is the uh, Musabbibul Asbab. He is the Sabab of the Sabab. He is the Khaliq of the Asbab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Malik of the Asbab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Raziq and our Hakim. And he is the one whose orders we have been sent to obey and to implement in this in our lives and in this world. So to rely on what Allah has given us, absolutely no problem. Alhamdulillah. Not only is it not a problem, it is the sunnah of Rasulullah to take reliance on the asbab. Rasulullah for example, in, in Badr, and I keep on repeating this instance of Badr because that's the most beautiful, uh, beautiful narrative where Rasulullah lived the tafsir of the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa salat Inna Allah ma'a sabirin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Oh you believe take the help isti'ana take the help of sabr wa salat Allah did not say salati wa sabr Allah said sabri wa salat Now so what is sabr? Sabr is to be patient, to be consistent, to be perseverant. It is to do everything in our power to ensure that the outcome is good. 
Sabar is not just to sit around and ask for the help of Allah. Sabar is not just to sit around and say, I'm being patient. No, you're not, you're not being patient. You are perhaps being lazy. If you have, if you were being patient, you would be working. You would be, would continue to make the effort and you would continue to change the effort, change the means, but not change the goal. Rasulullah beautifully demonstrated this. And in Badr, Rasul, as we know the whole story of Badr, Nabi Wasallam took the mashwara of the, of the Sahaba. He ensured that people were actually with him. And after that, when he was assured of that, Rasulullah then um, he, he uh, camped in the right place. He took the advice of the Sahabi who told him to camp in a different place. He moved the camp. Uh, they filled the cistern with water, so they had water. Rasulullah then allocated the battalions and who was to command which battalion and so on and so forth. Now the sabr was complete and then the other part of the ayah, Uwa Salah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood to Salah. Rasulullah made dua and he said, Oh Allah, if you don't want to be worshipped, then give victory to the uh, disbelievers, give victory to the Quraysh. But if you want to be worshipped, then give victory to us because if these people are finished, then there will not be anybody on the face of the earth to take your name. Oh Allah, help me like you promised me. Oh Allah, help me like you promised me. And he kept on making this dua until Abu Bakr Siddiq he uh, took him by the hand and he said, Bas Ya Rasulullah, enough Ya Rasulullah. Alhamdulillah, your Rabb will support you. So now the point I'm making here is that Hati wa is saying people rely on the asbab instead of relying on Allah. The key word there is instead. So relying on the asbab or making use of the asbab, Alhamdulillah, is part of our life and part of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. But where is the reliance? In the heart, where is my belief? Who is it that will give me success? Is it these means? Is it my money? Is it my authority? Is it my business? Is it my power? Or is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who by his amr makes it happen or, bu or who by his amr will make everything null and void? As I am speaking to you today, we are sitting in one of the biggest crises or the biggest crisis that we have ever faced as humanity globally, which is the same time the whole world, the entire world, from the most powerful countries to the least powerful countries, from the wealthiest countries to the poorest countries, from the countries whose name is a byword to the countries whose names we never heard, have all been affected by this coronavirus. It is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to bring down Namrud, Nimrod, who was the uh, who was the king at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam who tried to uh, burn Ibrahim alayhi salam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to finish him, he sent a small mosquito up his nose and this mosquito completely destroyed the man's brain. He became, he, he went mad with the pain of that. Allah did not send Jibreel alayhi salam to uh, kill uh, Namrud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunnah is that he uses the least of his creation to bring down the most arrogant of human beings. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done. Today, as a human race, we, including myself and yourself, we are collectively guilty of arrogance before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us. We are collectively guilty. We can point fingers at this one and that one and so on. And yes, you are, you, are, you may be right, but collective guilt, collective culpability rests with all of us as a human as the human race we are guilty of um, of arrogance before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent against us a creature which is so tiny that we can't even see it with our eyes unless we put it under an electron microscope you can't even see that a virus a very very tiny virus one strand of rna which is covered with fat that's it allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that thing against us and it has laid us low. Wallahi, it has affected us physically, it has affected us emotionally, it has affected us psychologically, it has affected us financially and materially, it has affected us in ways which we could not possibly imagine. When was the last time that you uh, could imagine uh, that you and your whole family would be sitting together in your house, not one day, two days, days after days, weeks after weeks, then you are not going anywhere. Where did you imagine that you could not go, that you would be unable to go to the mall, to shop, 
you would be unable to go and eat out in a restaurant you would be unable to go and watch a movie you would be unable to go uh, those of uh, those of you who go clubbing and so on and so forth time to think about this is uh, you would be unable to do that even those who used to pray in the masjid five times a day we have been prevented from doing that the masajid are locked up did we imagine this is going to happen though people did you imagine that there would be no planes in the sky that you would be sitting here like this and the sky is free from planes did you imagine that animals would come and take over cities animals have come from the wild and they are walking around in the street did you imagine you would ever see that did you imagine that in new york city you would be able to see the stars because the fo- the smog is finished the smog is gone blown away blue skies in new york city on the ground there is chaos on the ground there is death and and, and mayhem thanks to the corona virus but look up in the sky beautiful stars in the night sky is clear and clean did you imagine that you would see dolphins in new york harbor did you imagine that you would see actually dolphins in the i mean the most polluted place in the world you would you see that because all the shipping is stopped there is no shipping all uh, the skies are clear because there is no there are no cars there is no smog there are no taxis there is no noise there is no ambient light did you imagine you would you would see that but we are seeing it. we are actually seeing all and more of these signs right now the point to understand is that this is the khudrat of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalu this is what we rely on we don't rely on our means we do not rely on our means we rely on the khudrat of allah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also showing us that just like you try to destroy this world if i want i can i can bring this world back to life in a matter in in a, in a very very short time you took so many years to destroy it but how many years did it take for the for the for the harbors to become clean for the sky to become clean hours right it happened and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do that so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us this and therefore reliance on allah means that we use the means but we do not place our trust in the means tawakkul is the tawhid of the heart tawakkul is the tawhid of the heart tawakkul is where we say internally why are we even using the means because this is the hukum of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because i constantly get this question if allah is the one who is doing it why must i take the means because allah told you to use the means so use the means but don't rely on the means don't think that the means is giving it to you don't think that you are you, you are eating your food because somebody is paying your salary or because your business is doing well and what will happen to me if my salary stops what will happen to me if my business stops nothing will happen to you alhamdulillah you will still get your rizq from the one who wrote it if he stops one means he will open some other means and i always i always ask allah i said like give me without means i don't even want the means alhamdulillah i'm using the means because you told me to do it but i don't want it i want it directly from you so i can glorify you and i can sing your praises i do that anyway but i can do that more so my brothers and sisters please understand this i tell you a very nice little story i mentioned the story before as well some of you may have heard it but it's a lovely story uh, again it's not a uh, wallah alam i don't think it's a true story but it's a nice teaching story and it illustrates this issue of tawakkul very nicely the story is about this uh, this mountaineer this rock climber uh, who was very expert and he wanted to climb this particular mountain maybe it was the matterhorn in in uh, in europe which is considered to be one of the most difficult mountains to climb so he wanted to climb this mountain and he wanted to take a particularly tough route which nobody had done before because he wanted his name in the annals of history to say that he was the first man who scaled this mountain on this particular route so he made a lot of preparation for it physically prepared for it in terms of equipment and so on and so forth he got everything together and then he reached the base camp of this mountain and he is uh, getting ready now to uh, start climbing the mountain when the weather suddenly deteriorated the weather suddenly went bad people advised him they said look I'll just you know don't, don't do it today I mean, take a let it go a couple of days he said i don't know when this uh, weather front will clear maybe it takes a few days i don't have that much of time i have to get back so i must do it today i have decided i'm going to do it people advised him they said it's very very dangerous you might end up dead don't do that he did not listen he continued and he started climbing now he started getting up the mountain as he is climbing up the ma- he is alone he is alone there's nobody there with him no one to belay his ropes and so on and so forth no one to help him he is tapping in the 
the the pins and he's climbing up and you know hooking his ropes and so on. It's going up. Now as he's going up this rock face, sheer rock face, uh, this guy, the weather now starts deteriorating. So the weather is now getting going from bad to worse. Uh, bad winds. There is uh, snow. Uh, it's bitterly, bitterly cold, uh, and it's it's rock is becoming more and more slippery, um, and then it becomes completely dark, pitch dark. There's total darkness. He can't see anything. Now the man is is, is you know, way up on this rock. Uh, maybe he is close to the summit. Maybe he's about three quarters of the way up. But anyway, he's a few hundred feet up or a thousand feet up from the ground, and at that time in this pitch darkness. He slips. He slips and he falls. Now he is in free fall because there is no one to help him. He is, he is falling. Now as this man is falling, his whole life flashes before his eyes. In one second he is seeing himself from the from the beginning to the end. And he said, this is how I end. I am going to fall and smash on the rocks below. Now as he is falling, suddenly his rope snags on something and he is brought up short so he's a huge jerk and he's now like a pendulum he is swinging in midair but he is for the moment his fall has been broken his fall is stopped he tries to look around he can't see anything he's pissed out the man says oh god he screams i said oh god oh god help me he said oh god help me and he hears a voice the voice says, do you believe I can help you? And the man is absolutely astonished because, you know, this is the tendency of human beings. Sometimes people say, why does why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send uh, difficulties? Because that's the only time you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we are having fun, when we are sitting in the middle of all kinds of, uh, of wealth and so on? We don't remember Allah. We forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We remember Allah only when we have a problem. So here... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us a problem so that we turn towards him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, In Surah Al-Rum, Allah says, so that we can give them a taste of their deeds, taste of the evil of their deeds, so that they will turn back to us. So now here is a man, he's swinging in midair. He says, oh God, help me. And he hears his voice saying, do you really think I can help you? He looks around, there's nobody, he's pitch dark. He said, yes, only you can help me. Oh God, only you can help me. The voice says, are you sure? Are you certain about this? He <laughs> says, absolutely certain. Oh, there's nobody who can help me. Only you can help me. Please help me. Please save me. The voice says, are you sure? He says, I'm sure. Please, please, please help me. Please help me. The voice says, cut the rope. Cut the rope. You know, climbers and, and hikers and so on, they carry a knife. The voice says, cut the rope. Now imagine this man is hanging in midair and the voice is saying, cut the rope. I'm talking about reliance on the asbab. It's cut the rope. They say that next morning, search parties went out trying to look for this man and they found this man holding the rope with both hands, frozen to death, four feet above the ground. Four feet above the ground. What does that tell us? That shows us the meaning of tawakkul. Shows us the meaning of reliance. Use the means, but remember, the means can't do anything for you. The one who can do something does not need the means. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the man, cut the rope. If you rely on me, cut the rope. I will save you. If you had cut the rope, you would have walked. Now, as I told you, this is not a this is a teaching story. This is not a true story. And those of you, those people who have this, uh, this, this uh, tendency to just change God to Allah and make this into a Muslim story, please don't disgrace uh, Islam by doing this, uh, these things. I, I keep getting stories from all over the place. Where I, I've seen that story 20 times, I know where the story originated from and then all that they've done is they've removed Jesus and they put Allah or something. How disgusting and shameful is that? At least be original, you know, think of your own story. Anyway, to come back to the point here, I'm saying, Hatim al said, people rely on things instead of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And he says, whereas I, when I reflected on the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلَ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ He said, anyone who uh, relies on Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for him. Whoever puts his trust in Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will suffice him. In the ayat of Surah Talaq, Hatim uh, uh, al said, This is what I read and I reflected on this and I decided that I will rely only and only on Allah. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is tawakkul? Tawakkul is the result. Tawakkul is the outcome of two things that we must work on. The first one that we need to work on is the khashyat of Allah. And the second thing we need to work on is the ta'alluq with Allah. The khashyat of Allah is the awe and glory and the kind of fear. It's not a fear as in the fear that comes from things we hate. This is the fear as in the, we are so much in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's majesty and his power and his authority that we there is a sense of fear in the heart. This is a very positive kind of fear. Uh, which is something that we need to work on because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said those who know Allah are those who fear who have this khashyat of Allah the sign of knowing Allah the sign of an alim is that he has khashyat not that somebody is qualified and read so many books somebody who has khashyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said uh, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the people from the slaves, from the creatures of Allah, from the insan, from the human beings, those who have the greatest khashyat of Allah are the ulama. They are the people who are truly knowledgeable because they have the khashyat of Allah in their hearts. May Allah make us people of khashyat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned khashya as the uh, outcome of knowing him and the way of and the way we know Allah is through his Quran, his Quran and, Majid, and we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us this law and had al Quran ala Jabali Laraitahu Khashi Am Mutasodya min Khashatila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said with Tilka Lam Salu Nadri Buha Lina Sila Allah Yatafakarun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al Hashar that if this Quran had been sent on a mountain, the mountain would have humbled itself to dust with the khashyat of Allah. So the first thing to concentrate on our hearts and say, do I have khashyat of Allah in my heart? The sign of khashyat is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how to understand his glory and majesty of Allah. The first condition, the way to build tawakkul is to have, talk as I told you, tawakkul is not, doesn't happen by itself. Tawakkul is the result. It's the, it's the result. The result comes from doing two things. One is to build khashyat of Allah in our hearts. How do we build khashyat of Allah? By focusing on and learning and 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 becoming conscious of the glory and majesty of Allah. When we become conscious of the glory and majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this brings a condition in our heart which is called khashyat. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for to fill our hearts with this khashyat. And this, the sign of that, do I, how do I know if I have khashyat in my heart? I need to look at my own life and say, am I obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? To what extent am I obedient to Allah? To what extent am I careful about the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I'm not just talking about being obedient with respect to for, uh, to doing the halal and, and leaving the haram. That is a boundary condition. I'm talking about more than that. I'm talking about ihtiyat. I'm talking about being careful with the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not talking about transgressing or not transgressing the boundary. I'm talking about not even going close to the boundary. Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Tilka la ta'taduha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, la taqrabuha. Allah said, these are the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not even go near them. Because as Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, he said the, uh, the shepherd who grazes his sheep close to the boundary of the king is always in danger of the fact that some of the sheep may transgress and go across the boundary and the shepherd will be in trouble. He says the, the what Allah has made haram, these are the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't even go near them. Don't even go near them. Don't try and play games and say, well, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm just doing this much. No. This is a sign of lack of khashyat. People who, are, who play games with the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
This is a sign of the lack of khashyat. People who have khashyat are people who are extremely careful uh, with the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not even go close to that. Let me give you an example. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Remember, I'm giving you examples of people who are the final byword in terms of knowledge of Islam. Nobody in the world, except the Anbiya alayhi wa sallam, except Musa alayhi wa sallam, nobody in this world came close to the knowledge that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu has of Islam. No one in the world without exception. None of the Sahaba <coughs> came close to the knowledge that Abu Bakr Siddiq Radalanu had because the Sahaba themselves considered Abu Bakr Siddiq Radalanu as their Sheikh, as their uh, Imam. Baada Rasulullah Sallallahu after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A woman came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked a question. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Come back tomorrow, I will answer it. She said, If you are not there, what should I do? Meaning, her, her intention was, uh, or her implication was, if you have passed away, what must I do? He said, go to Abu Bakr. Go to Abu Bakr. And she said, if Abu Bakr is not there, what must I do? He said, go to Umar. So, these two were the closest companions of Nabi Sallallahu And this was the precedence in order of importance of the of these two Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu So, Abu Bakr Siddiq one day, he came home. Uh, and he was hungry. He asked his uh, servant, he said, is there anything to uh, eat? The servant brought him a bowl of milk and gave it to him. Abu Bakr Siddiq Radalanu drank the milk. After he drank the milk, the servant said to him, you know, he said, yeah, Sayyidi, you always ask me about the source of whatever I give you. If I give you something to eat, you always ask me, where did you get this from and so on and so forth. He said, today you never asked me uh, about this. So Abu Bakr Siddiq Radalanu said to him, uh, you know I am so careful about these things so I expect you to be careful so where did you get this from the man said before I became Muslim I used to be a, a magician you know I used to do magic and I used to do whatever uh, which all of which is haram in Islam as you know um, so he said before I became Muslim this is what I used to do I did something for a tribe which lives on the outskirts of Medina Today and then and they and that time I did this for them and they didn't pay me. Today I was passing by there and they gave me this milk as a payment. So I brought it home and I gave it to you, you drank it. Now think about the fiqh of this thing, think about the usul of this. First and foremost, what the man did before his Islam is not valid after his Islam because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgets, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. All sins of a person once a person becomes Muslim. So this man is forgiven. Number one. Number two. What he got was payment for his work. It has nothing to do whatsoever with Abu Bakr Siddiq. Milk by itself is halal. How the man got the milk is not the problem of Abu Bakr Siddiq. It's not his responsibility. The man gave Abu Bakr Siddiq this milk as a gift. It is Abu Bakr Siddiq um, choice to accept the gift and to eat it or drink it. There is no blame on him whatsoever. Final point, before he drank it, did he know the source of this thing? He did not know. So he drank it without knowledge. So there is no blame and no responsibility on Abu Bakr Siddiq Radhiallahu Legally speaking, nothing at all on him whatsoever. But see what he does. And this is the meaning of the khashyat of Allah. What does he do? Abu Bakr Siddiq Radhiallahu started vomiting. He went outside and he put his fingers in his mouth, down his throat and he started throwing up. He threw up all the milk and he kept on doing that until he brought out blood. People stopped him. They said, you will kill yourself. What are you doing? He said, I have heard from my Habib. Who is the Habib of Abu Bakr Siddiq? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I have heard from my Habib that if a single morsel of haram goes into the body, the fire of Jahannam becomes wajib on that body. Now, this is the ihtiyat. This is the care with, with which Abu Bakr Siddiq Radhiallahu is treating the boundaries of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In his case, what he drank was not haram. It was not even doubtful because he did not know this before he drank it. Yet, because he got the knowledge after that, he is trying to make amends to the best of his ability. Ask yourself, what do you do with, the, with all the stuff that you eat and drink? 
How many times have we have we talked about this to think to say drinks like Coke and Pepsi and so on, anything which has a secret formula by definition is not permissible for a Muslim because you don't know what is in it. Right? You do not know what's in it. When you don't know what is in it, how do you drink it? How do you eat it? Because this is something which you do not know about. How do you eat and drink something which you don't know about? And you say you are careful about the boundaries of Allah. How is it possible? What about chickens especially, but what about things where you are not sure whether that thing has been uh, slaughtered in the halal way or not? Unless it is hand slaughtered by a Muslim, it is not halal. I am not making the, uh, the uh, fatwa for this. I am telling you what is the most reliable opinion among all the scholars. There are scholars who have permitted various things, but everyone is agreed upon that if something which is halal itself, which is what is permissible among the animals and birds to eat, if that thing has been hand slaughtered by a Muslim saying Bismillahi Allahu Akbar, then Alhamdulillah this is perfectly halal. Everyone is agreed upon this. How many of us stick to that and say, I will not die if I don't eat chicken one day. I will not die if I don't eat something one day, some meat one day. There are people in this world who do not eat meat their whole lives in order to please their gods. And we know that there is no one who is worthy of worship except Allah. And to please that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I cannot give up eating uh, doubtful chickens or doubtful meat one time. What kind of iman is this? Think about that. What does it say about my khashya? Somebody who is doing that, if that person is claiming that he has khashyat in his heart, he must look in the mirror and ask himself, am I lying to myself? Never lie to yourself. Ask yourself. So therefore, khashyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes from focusing on the glory and majesty of Allah, the signs of Allah in this life, which we are seeing in this world, and then what Allah told us about the ghaib, limanil mulkul yawm, lillahi al-wahidul khahar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about the day of judgment, and so on and so forth, to focus on that. And how do I find that there is khashyat in my heart? By looking at my amal, to see, by seeing if I am obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. If I am obedient to Allah, then I have khashyat. If I am not obedient to Allah, then I do not have khashyat. I need to work on that. The second condition for building of tawakkul is ta'aluk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is to have connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the way to build ta'aluk? The way to build ta'aluk is shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is to work on the... Uh, on being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. This is the way to build ta'aluq with Allah. Because our ta'aluq with Allah is the ta'aluq of, we are the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need Allah for every single breath we take. Subhanallah, wallahi, this is something that is so, so clearly evident today in this COVID-19. I was recently attending a interfaith uh, meeting on, on Zoom and uh, when it was my turn to speak, I said to them, I said to all the people who were there uh, from different faiths, I said, please take a deep breath. So they all took a deep breath. Now when they took the deep breath, I said to them, I want you to think about this. Did you struggle to take that breath? How did it feel? They said, oh, it felt very nice. I said, did you have to struggle? I said, no. I said, you know, when a person is dying of COVID-19, in their last moments, what happens to them? They cannot breathe. It's called respiratory failure. That's a long word for he can't breathe or she can't breathe. Every single breath we take, let us be conscious and let us thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rab, you allowed me to breathe and you allowed me to breathe without any problem. Right? Somebody sent me the other day uh, these, these things that keep coming on, on the internet. We also talked about this. Now, think about that. Just imagine that you are breathing and you are breathing freely without any problem. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. My brothers and sisters, you want to develop ta'aluq with Allah? Learn to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learn to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. List your blessings. List your blessings. Write them down. List your blessings. List all the things that you owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you want to count the blessings of Allah, you will not be able to count it. I want you to really try to do that, you know, try to do that so that you are conscious of this thing and say, I really can't count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just a figurative speech, 
This is the actual reality. I cannot count the blessings of Allah. So think about this and reflect on this and focus on this and say, what can I do to uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The more you thank Allah, the more your ta'aluk with Allah will build. Khashyat comes from the glory and awe and majesty of Allah. The sign of khashyat is obedience. The uh, ta'aluk with Allah comes from being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sign of that is to see how much shukr there is in our lives. Monitor your conversation. Monitor your speech. Anytime you are speaking and complaining about something, monitor that and immediately curtail that. Now my mother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her uh, Jannat al-Firdaus bihayri. She used to say, when we live in Hyderabad, in India, where in the, in the summer it gets terribly, terribly hot. And in those days, there was no air conditioning or anything. Temp temperatures go to 48 degrees, 49 degrees Celsius. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes I used to say chicken, chickens lay omelets instead of eggs. Now, it's so uh, bitterly hot that when somebody would come to my mother and they would say, Kya garmi hai, Begum sahab? My mother would say, Oh, garmi ki dhanam hai, garmi hoti. Usme bolne ka kya my, my, my mother would say, Yes, in the summer it is hot. So what's, what's there to complain? What's there to talk about? Now, this is the... The attitude of Shikha is Alhamdulillah. How is it? Alhamdulillah. How is it? Alhamdulillah. My brothers and sisters, uh, you know, really ask yourself this question and say, how many times do we thank? And consciously, th it's not just about Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. No, consciously thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Consciously thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now today, we are living in a world where masajid have been closed. I know many people are complaining about that. But thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who used to pray regularly in the masjid. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the, the hadith of Jabir bin Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, he said, Jabir bin Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu said that we were on an expedition with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, there are people among you who are in Medina who are with you now and they are crossing every valley that you are crossing. They are with you because of their illness that they could not accompany you. They are sitting in Medina but Allah is giving them the reward of this. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, anyone who does any deed regularly when he cannot do that because of illness or because of travel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes that deed to be written in his amal continuously uh, until he can do it again or until he passes away. Yeah? So, Alhamdulillah, massages are closed. Alhamdulillah, no problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who used to pray regularly in the masajid, Inshallah al mustaan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ha is having your salah by jama written in your amal even though you are not able to go to the masjid because you are not going to the masjid is not because of you, it is because of circumstances beyond your control. Alhamdulillah. Those who didn't go to the masjid, what are you complaining about? You never went anyway. So this is what we need to ask is look in the mirror and say to yourself, swear to yourself, make a promise and say, Inshallah al mustan we ask Allah to open the masjid as quickly as possible and when that happens, I promise myself, Inshallah, I will go to the masjid at least one time a day. Ideally, I will pray all five salat in my in a masjid, maybe any masjid, but I pray five salawat by jama in a masjid. But if I can't pray five, <coughs> I will at least pray one salah in the masjid once the masjid open. Fill the masjid, make them abad, not the viran masjid that we have today. May Allah, may Allah protect us today. People who are complaining, ask them how many times did you go? Did you go and pray? I have prayed. I have led salah with one single person behind me. One single person. And that was one. The little boy who was at that time eight years old. He's a, he's a dear friend of mine. His father is a dear friend of mine. His name is Faisal. May Allah bless him. Make dua for him. Inshallah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must make him a standard bearer of Islam. That little boy. Just that one little boy standing behind me. And I still remember it was Salatul Fajr. It was raining. bit heavy rain. And when the time for Salah came, I called the Adhan. And after that, I'm standing there. Uh, there's nobody there. I, I say Allah Akbar and I stand and in the, by the corner of my eye, I see something yellow standing right behind me, a little bit to my, uh, to my, uh, to my left. And I'm thinking, oh Allah, subhanAllah, what is this? Is you know, some creature of Allah. But I said, anyway, whatever creature of Allah is praying, so let it pray. And when I finish my salah, who do I see? I see little Faisal. He's there. He's wearing a, a yellow jacket. I mean, he gave me the fright of my life in the, in the beginning. But there he was. SubhanAllah. I mean, imagine this is the this is uh, the, the, the doing of the parents. May Allah bless his parents. They send that little boy out for salah, to fajr 
even though it is raining of course in our masjid there is a between uh, the house and the between his uh, apartment at that time and the masjid it was it's covered so he wasn't walking in the rain but the point i'm saying is despite that that little boy came so i'm saying i have led salah salatul fajr with one person so who is complaining today right we are talking about oh masjid is closed so what you never went when the when the masjid was open you didn't come it's not as if that that little faisal was the only person there there were other people they didn't come so the point i'm saying is that make this niyat to yourself and say i will not miss salah by jama insha allah once the masajid are open <clears throat> so the shukr of allah so we thank allah and we say alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa taala caused the deeds also to be written for us even though we were not doing them we ask allah subhanahu wa taala for this i am going to um, uh, i am going to talk about this uh, uh, this thing some more inshallah because this is uh, this needs uh, this needs more uh, more time uh, but uh, I thought let me uh, talk just about tawakkul at this moment and uh, then we will look at uh, something else and yeah, we'll look at this in more detail in the next class the next class also will be on the same subject of tawakkul inshallah now therefore my uh, request to you and my reminder to myself is let us work on building tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brothers and sisters today we are in this corona corona virus we are living in a state where the whole world is panicking right everybody is in a panic and saying oh my god what will happen i will die but alhamdulillah we thank allah subhanahu wa taala for islam we are not panic why because no we because we know we will die anyway what is the sense of panicking about something which is inevitable let us panic and i don't mean panic in a mad sense i mean panic as in let us be concerned about that which is not inevitable which is jahannam let us worry about what will happen to me after i die Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote that into our account. Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us that freedom. I mean not it. Allah gave us that freedom to decide what we want to write into our qadar as far as the akhirah is concerned. <clears throat> If I want jannah, Allah gave me the freedom to decide jannah and write jannah. If I don't want jannah, that is also may Allah protect us from this. So let us focus on that. No point in panicking about it. Alhamdulillah, we make dua to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us make dua for hidayah for all those who do not have hidayah let us make dua for forgiveness for all those who have hidayah and still are doing wrong things we ask allah subhanahu wa taala to forgive all of us we ask allah subhanahu wa taala to make istighfar to allah subhanahu wa taala we turn to allah subhanahu wa taala in our brokenness in our helplessness we acknowledge his glory and his majesty and his power and his authority we promise that we will follow his orders we promise that we will not go against him against his orders we promise allah subhanahu wa taala inshallah that we will do all that he has ordered us to do and we will stop from all that he ordered us not to do we promise allah subhanahu wa taala that we will follow the sunnah of his habib muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we promise to make our incomes halal and our and our outcomes and our work halal we promise to we promise never to eat or drinks anything which is doubtful we promise to control our tongues we promise to control our akhlaq and our amal and we promise to become uh, people who will be a blessing for all those who come into contact with us we ask allah subhanahu wa taala for his mercy we ask allah subhanahu wa taala for his forgiveness wa sallallahu ala nabiyil karim wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin walhamdulillah